Our speaker today is Dr. Eugene Merrill, and he rightfully bears the title Distinguished Professor of Old Testament Studies. Uh, he has served on the faculty of Dallas Seminary since 1975, and his teaching ministry spans more than 40 years. He's been heavily involved in international Christian ministry in Europe, Asia, and especially in the Middle East. As a scholar, he regularly contributes to leading journals, periodicals, dictionaries, encyclopedias, and many of you have read his commentaries. When I think about Dr. Merrill, the word consummate, uh, churchman, and scholar, those words come to mind. He has taught a Sunday school class at First Baptist Church for more than 20 years, and they have established a scholarship in his name uh, on our campus because of that blessing that he has been to them. Uh, academia, and especially Christian academia, runs in his family. His wife, Janet, holds a doctorate in counselor education from Columbia University, and his daughter, Sonia, earned a PhD in medical ethics from the University of London and an MD from Harvard University. I, I can't imagine what life is like when all three of them get around the table. <laughs> but I bet the conversations are stimulating. Uh, Dr. Merrill, we love you, we esteem you, uh, we welcome you to our chapel uh, on this day. Lord bless you as you speak. Let's welcome Dr. Merrill, shall we? Before I get into the text, uh, a couple of observations I want to make. First of all, it's been a number of years since I've preached here in chapel. I think it's been so long, in fact, that if I recall, Dr. Pentecost was just an assistant professor at that time. <laughs> but I'm also not unmindful of the fact that today is April Fool's Day. <laughs> and the chaplain, I think, has waited for this very occasion to have me preach again. In fact, I was uh, thinking about uh, pulling some kind of an April Fool's joke on him, and the one that headed my list was not to come to chapel today. <laughs> but I thought better of it, and indeed, I welcome the opportunity to be here with you today. And we're going to speak on the wisdom from above. In doing that, we have to talk about fools first. We have to know who fools are before we can know who wise men and women are. I did a little research on the origin of April Fool's Day. Now, many ancient cultures celebrated April 1st as New Year's Day since it introduced the first full month after the vernal equinox in the spring, which usually falls around March 20 and 21st. In 1582, Pope Gregory replaced the Julian calendar, calling for January 1st, then to be New Year's Day. But many countries were slow to adopt this change, England, for example, waiting until 1752. In France, many people resisted this change, and for doing so, for being so recalcitrant, they became the butt of many jokes, including having a label taped to their back, unaware, reading Poisson d'Avril, April Fish, which somehow became transmuted into April Fool. So that's uh, kind of the background of this day that we celebrate or that we dread, whatever the case may be. Before I go further with my remarks, let's get a little more serious and turn to the Word of God, I want to begin with a New Testament text, and then I want to end with an Old Testament text. Turn with me, if you will, to James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? He should show his works by good conduct with wisdom's gentleness. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't brag and lie in defiance of the truth. 
such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every kind of evil. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peace-loving, gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, without favoritism and hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. First of all, I want to look at the biblical concept of the fool. We who love words, and that includes all of us in this room, I trust, as exegetes or potential exegetes of the Word of God, we like to play around with lexicography and have a great interest in such things. It's come to my attention over the years that a culture, a culture's vocabulary tells us a great deal about the nature of that culture, historically, artistically, geographically. For example, I understand there are about 18 words for ice in the Inuit languages of uh, the frozen north. One word for ice, I think, suffices for most of us. We don't like it uh, unless it's in a cold beverage of some sort. They have all these words because they can see in ice a great variety of, uh, of differences. This kind of ice, that kind of ice, this color, that color, this form, that shape. In the Old Testament itself, I often make the point when I'm teaching biblical history and geography the environment in which Israel grew as a nation. There are at least five key words for desert. Most of us just know the word desert, do we not, in English? But uh, there are five words for desert. But astoundingly, there are nine words for fool. And so Israel had many words for desert because it lived in a desert environment and I want to suggest that there are nine words at least for fool because, like ourselves, those people also were characterized by a great deal of foolishness of all shades and hues and kinds. We are essentially fools, all of us. We're born that way at least. And by fool, I don't mean lack of education, lack of training, or anything of that sort. In fact, I think it's uh, interesting to maybe provide a list, uh, first of all, of what uh, wisdom is not, and then what wisdom is, and then we'll address what the Bible has to say about foolishness. And of course, the antithesis of foolishness is wisdom. Well, wisdom, first of all, is not intellectual acumen. You can uh, be as brilliant as you want to be. You can be long to the Mensa organization and still be a fool. I suppose that organization is populated with fools. <laughs> it has uh, no necessary correlation with philosophical sophistication or with educational attainment. Somebody has once said there's no fool like an educated fool. Sometimes you can do more damage as a fool by being educated than you can otherwise. There are certain sins you cannot commit until you're very intelligent, very brilliant, and very well educated. It has nothing to do with a worldly urbanity, a kind of a sense of uh, self-centered, self-promotional conceit. But what is wisdom according to the Bible? I think we need to hear this in an academic institution. I'm not opposed to education. If I were, I wouldn't be here, would I? Nor should we be, all of us, opposed to education, to achieving the highest level of education we can get and to do the best we can in the pursuit of our education. There's nothing wrong with good grades, with working hard to achieve excellence. But you see, this has little or nothing to do with wisdom. 
In my view, wisdom, first of all, is a God-centered worldview. How you look at the world tells a lot about how wise you are. Spiritual sensitivity, spiritual awareness are indications of godly wisdom. Proper ethical and moral behavior is indicative of wisdom. Skillful use of time and of the gifts that God has given us. And just plain old sanctified common sense. Some of the wisest people I've ever known have been ill-educated but have possessed tremendous ability to get along in this world, to know how to learn, uh, to, uh, who, who know how to live skillfully. Well, now, the classic biblical definition of the fool is in Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool has said to himself, literally, in his heart, there's no God. So the ultimate fool is the atheist, or if not the atheist in the strict and pure sense of the term, at least a person who says, I have no need for God in my life. So one can believe in the existence of God and still be a fool. It has to do with the idea that there's no God for me. I can make it on my own. We have an interesting biblical example of a fool, which is a rather humorous anecdote in 1 Samuel 25, 25, where Abigail said to David concerning her husband, whose name was Naval or Nabal, Naval is his name, and Naval is he indeed. Naval means fool. I suspect this was a rather dysfunctional marriage. <laughs> when the wife says, my husband's name is a fool and uh, he is named well. He is indeed a fool. But it's to Solomon that we must turn and to the wisdom literature particularly, much of which came from Solomon's gifted and inspired pen. When we first uh, meet Solomon, after the birth narrative of Solomon, we find him as an 18-year-old young man getting ready to succeed his father on the throne of Israel. You may be astounded to realize that's how old he was at the time David began to turn over to him the responsibilities of kingship. We read of this in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 1 where David speaks of his own son as young and inexperienced. He's just a youth and he's lacking in knowledge. And of course Solomon himself quickly realized in those days how dependent he was on the knowledge and more particularly the wisdom that was necessary if he was going to administer the affairs of the kingdom. In fact, in his uh, great prayer uh, recorded in 1 Kings chapter 3, while he's at uh, Gibeon uh, offering up sacrifice and worship before the Lord, his father is now deceased. Solomon is probably 20 years of age. When he comes to this recognition that he desperately needs the wisdom that God can give, and so he calls himself just a little lad, a na'arkaton, just a young man, inexperienced in the ways of the world and in desperate need of wisdom. I suspect he got the finest schooling that was possible in that day and age, being the son of the king. He probably had private tutors and all manner of academic disciplines. There was nothing wrong with his education, but Solomon was quick to realize that that was not enough. To do the business of heaven requires heavenly wisdom. And so uh, he's offered all kinds of options as a free gift of the grace of God, and he 
asks that God will give him wisdom, that he might have wisdom and knowledge, 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 10. Now, what was the source then of Solomon's wisdom? Well, it was God alone. Only from God could he get wisdom and the fear of God. Solomon many times said in the Proverbs, for example, that the fear of Yahweh is reshit, it's the chief part. It's the beginning and the, uh, and the chief part of wisdom. To fear God, of course, is to know him savingly and to love him and to serve him and to worship him and to praise him, to make him a vital element, in fact, the central element of your life. And until we have come to that place, we cannot really experience the wisdom of God. The same epistle of James, of course, makes the same point. If we lack wisdom, we are to ask him. The very embodiment of wisdom. I find it fascinating to see how Solomon displayed the wisdom that God had given him. Turn with me back to 1 Kings chapter 3, where we have uh, a very familiar anecdote, the story of... Uh, the two harlots, both of whom claimed the same baby. It seems to me it would take the wisdom of Solomon to be able to solve this one. But uh, really it takes the wisdom of God. And so in verses uh, 16 through 28 of uh, 1 Kings 3, we needn't read the narrative because you're very familiar with it we find, I think, the essence of what Old Testament wisdom is about. Solomon didn't uh, check a number of uh, lexicons and dictionaries and uh, encyclopedias, as far as I can tell. He didn't pull out his old class notes and uh, go over them to come up with some kind of an answer as to how to solve this problem of two women claiming the same baby, the baby having died, of course, tragically, as part of the story or it seems uh, one did and the other survived. But uh, Solomon said, well, uh, the answer is quite clear what we have to do. We'll just uh, cut the baby in half and give half to each mother, and that's a fair and equitable way of dealing with this kind of an issue in life. But the true mother in this case says, no, don't do that. Give this baby to the other woman. I'd rather the baby lived with somebody else than to die in my possession. Now that's tremendous wisdom, isn't it? Because this shows that Solomon has an insight in a human nature, a profound understanding of what makes people tick. That comes from careful observation. That comes, I think, also because of an interest in people, a love for people. I think there's a certain giftedness here uh, that uh, some who are involved in counseling may possess uh, that others of us don't have, but when we seek the mind of God, the wisdom of God, even in issues like this, he gives us the ability, I think, to make decisions that cannot be made on a purely rational or intellectual level. But even more uh, fascinating to me, we find in 1 Kings chapter 4, you're right there, in that passage, and look with me at verses 32 to 34. I don't know if you've ever noticed these or not, these, these three verses. 1 Kings chapter 4, 32. Solomon composed 3,000 proverbs, and his songs numbered 1,005. He described trees, from the cedar in Lebanon to the hyssop growing out of the wall. He also taught about animals, birds, reptiles, and fish. People came from everywhere, sent by every king on earth who had heard of his wisdom to listen to Solomon's wisdom. Well, what is he, some kind of a botanist? Is he some kind of a zoologist? A herpetologist? An ichthyologist? All this bird business and reptiles and plants and trees? Did he have a graduate degree in these disciplines? No. That's not the point at all. Solomon was observant. 
and he could see in the creation of Almighty God something of the majesty and the glory and the power and the aesthetic side of his Father in heaven. So it's not that he uh, could tell you all about uh, the gestation periods of various kinds of animals. That was not important. But he observed their behavior and he observed their beauty. He observed their habits and could draw conclusions not so much about them but about their creator. He learned from the observation of his environment something about his God. How many times do we blithely make our way across the campus when the roses are in full bloom or in this time of the year when the leaves are beginning to come out on the trees and pay no heed whatsoever to the beauty around us? How often do we see the little squirrels frisking about and don't stop for a moment to marvel at the ingenuity of these creatures who have known enough to plant their acorns in the fall and harvest them in the spring? especially up in the northern climates. This tells us, does it not, something about God. It's interesting there in verse 33 again, he described trees from the cedar to the hyssop. Cedar being the largest of all known plants in that part of the world, and the hyssop, a tiny plant growing in a crevice of a wall someplace. And this is a figure of speech, as you well know, a merism, which means that he knew about all kinds of plants and all their particularities and peculiarities and how instructed he was by what he saw. Uh, come over to Proverbs uh, chapter 30, which is not necessarily Solomonic, but I think makes pretty much the same point. Uh, turn over to, well, yes, turn to uh, chapter 30, verses 24 uh, through uh, 26, I think will be, uh, no, excuse me, 28, 24 to 28. Four things on earth are small, yet they're extremely wise. The ants are not a strong people, yet they store up their food in the summer. Hyraxes are not a mighty people, yet they make their homes in the cliffs. Locusts have no king. Yet all of them march in ranks. A lizard can be caught in your hands, yet it lives in king's palaces. And we think we're smart. These brute beasts created by God with certain intuitive skills and capacities, from these we can learn. We can become wise by observing the habit of an ant. Can we not? Go back to Proverbs chapter 6. And let's take a look at a, another passage beginning in verse 6 where the ant is held forth as a rebuke to you and me. Proverbs 6 beginning in verse 6. Go to the ant, you slacker. Observe its ways and become wise. Notice that? Without leader, administrator, or ruler, it prepares its provisions in summer. It gathers its food during harvest. How long will you stay in bed, you slacker? Man, that's uncomfortable. When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the arms to rest, and your poverty will come like a robber, your need like a bandit. We have a lot of uh, fire ant mounds around our property. I suppose everybody does in this part of the world. And sometimes I have to go out and treat those things, but before I do it, I have a fiendish delight sometimes in simply kicking over the mound <laughs> and watching those little inhabitants of that mound to see what their reaction will be. I've noticed they don't just sulk someplace off in the corner or fold their little hands or arms or whatever they have and sit down in abject discouragement, but no. <laughs> Immediately, they're rebuilding. They're at it, they're busy, they're saving their eggs, they're attending to the queen, they're doing everything an ant is supposed to do in the world of ants. 
And when I do that, I think, how lazy I am. Slightest little trial or problem that comes into my life, and I want to quit. I want to give up, don't you? How wise the ant is and how much we can learn from this. Well, I wish the story of Solomon ended there, but it did not, as you know. Solomon, who started so well and who understood the wisdom of God so perfectly, ended up so tragically. So the wisest man on the earth became perhaps the most foolish man on earth. Now, how does that happen? Well, we can boil it down, because I don't have time to explore all the text. It comes down to covenant unfaithfulness. God had given Solomon explicit instruction as to how he was to guide the affairs of the kingdom. And we can read some of it for ourselves here. First of all, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 11, near the end of his life and the end of his reign, 1 Kings 11, the first three verses, King Solomon loved many foreign women and Pharaoh's daughter. And all these are mentioned. From the nations that the Lord had told the Israelites about, do not intermarry with them and they must not intermarry with you because they will turn you away from me to their gods. Solomon was deeply attached to these women and loved them. In direct violation of Deuteronomy 7 and other texts, which are part of that whole covenant arrangement between God and his people. And the king who was commanded in that same book of Deuteronomy to read the text of the law regularly to prevent himself and his nation from lapsing into this kind of idolatry was the first to lead them in that direction. Whatever wisdom Solomon had seems to have dissipated, and the wise man was replaced by a fool. Verse 4 says that uh, when Solomon was old, his wife seduced him to follow other gods, and now notice his heart was not completely with the Lord his God as his father David's heart had been. That's the way of speaking of becoming a fool. Well, what were the results of this? Verse 9, the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice. And then 11 to 13, and the Lord said to Solomon, since you've done this and did not keep my covenant, you see, it's clear, is it not? And my statutes, which I commanded you, I will tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servants. However, I'll not do it during your lifetime because of your father David. I will tear it out of your son's hand. Indeed, I will not tear the entire kingdom away from him. I will give one tribe to your son because of my servant David and because of Jerusalem that I chose. I don't know what God might have for you in the years to come. I like to be filled with optimism and to believe that from this point on for the rest of your life, you'll be wise men and women and not fools. That you will love and serve and obey the great God who has made you wise unto salvation and live out your lives as faithful servants of Jesus Christ. I want to close with the words of Solomon himself, words which tragically he seems not to have taken very much to heart. Proverbs chapter 4, and let's close with this, verses 1 to 9. Listen, my sons, to a father's discipline and pay attention so that you may gain understanding. For I'm giving you good instruction. Don't abandon my teaching. When I was a son with my father, tender and precious to my mother, he taught me and said, your heart must hold on to my words. Keep my commands and live. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Don't forget a turn or turn away from the words of my mouth. Don't abandon wisdom and she will watch over you. Love her and she will guard you. 
Wisdom is supreme, so get wisdom. And whatever else you get, get understanding. Cherish her and she will exalt you. If you embrace her, she will honor you. She will place a garland of grace on your head. She will give you a crown of beauty. Let's pray. Our Father, we read in the epistle to the Colossian church that Jesus Christ himself is the embodiment, the incarnation of wisdom. Thank you that when we know him, we become wise. Guard us, I pray, Father, against the tendency, the temptation, that faces all of us to be wise according to the standards of the world. Because such wisdom, as Paul informs us in Corinthians, is indeed nothing but foolishness. Help us in the midst of our academic and educational pursuits to understand that we do not learn wisdom in textbooks. We learn wisdom when we know you and when we fear you. May we commit ourselves to that today, Father, May that be a pledge and a commitment that will sustain us through all our days. We ask in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.